Now, last week, nine climate activists from the Extinction Rebellion protest group here in the UK were acquitted by a jury of causing around $600,000 worth of criminal damage after shattering windows at the headquarters of the HSBC Bank in London. The activists, all women, admitted using hammers and chisels to break windows at that HSBC building in the Canary Wharf district of London's financial quarter. And they carried out the attack in April 2021. They were protesting against the bank's investments in coal and and for facilitating other fossil fuel financing. But they denied that what they did was a criminal act and the jury agreed with their legal argument. Gully Bajak was one of the nine protesters and who was acquitted and she now works as a community organiser in the northeast English city of Hull. She's been talking to me about how she feels about her acquittal. You're right that we didn't deny that we caused some damage to extra species windows. That was completely agreed from the beginning. But everything that Extinction Rebellion does is completely accountable. We are accountable to the law and the process. At HSBC, we waited for around an hour for the police to arrive and complied with them completely. What we said to the jury was a lot about the climate crisis. We were allowed a few defences to speak around for the duration of the trial, one being necessity. And necessity basically says what we did was absolutely necessary to prevent a greater harm. So yes, we caused some damage, to property, but it was necessary to prevent suffering, harm and loss of life, ultimately. That enabled us to talk to the jury directly about climate breakdown and about all of HSBC's investments. They're the second biggest investors in fossil fuels in Europe. And obviously, the jury are a captive audience, like it or not. So for three weeks, we talked to them about that. Were you surprised that you were acquitted or was it increasingly clear as the case progressed that the jury might respond in this way? It's hard to say. Obviously, you always hope. I've been doing this kind of work for several years now, and you hope that you are connecting with people and getting through to people. What I would say is that we know from polls and from our experience and from our own personal lives, people in this country and all over the world are concerned, are terrified about the climate crisis. There just isn't currently political will or avenues for people to get involved in doing something about it. So I had that sort of confidence, if you like, going into it, that I trusted that they would be able to listen to what we were saying with an open mind and take it on board because we know it's going to affect their lives. And a lot of what we talked about was the effects of the climate crisis here in the UK, and how I had learned about air pollution in particular a few years ago during Extinction Rebellion and how the court that we were in, Southwark Crown Court, is predicted to be underwater in about 20 years' time. So you talked about human consequences and that leads me to my next question because you've also spoken about the human conscience and how that has been a factor that has played on your mind throughout all of this. I'd be keen for you to explain that to me a bit more. The human conscience is sort of been outlawed from the British legal system, apart from in the jury, the legal system and the wider British establishment is desperate to rule out the rule of conscience, if you like. And we knew going into it that we would probably be reprimanded by the judge if we reminded the jury of that ourselves. But it feels to me like juries are one of the last remaining spaces where human conscience can really be allowed to exercise itself. It's a space of 12, a group of people who've never met before and who have presumably very diverse lives and experiences for this brief window of time that doesn't seem to happen in the rest of society anymore, really. They sit down and they talk about a big pressing issue and they are enabled to sift through all the different information and come to their own conclusion. And particularly in this case, obviously, as you said, we didn't bother denying that we caused the damage because that's not the point. They had to make a judgment based off things that are beyond that simple fact of us causing £500,000 worth of damage to some glass. They had to consider all the other contextual elements. And that's what conscience is. It's taking in all the information and not just the factual information, but the sort of moral, human information and the feeling to it and coming to a decision based off that. 
Gully, some people might be listening to this. They're all for healthy debate, healthy conversation, tapping into the human conscience, which is what you want to see more people doing. But ultimately what you did was a gesture that many will consider violent and aggressive and many will say did not make any real difference. What is your response to that? Well, I definitely disagree that it was violent. I don't personally feel you can be violent against an inanimate object like a piece of glass. I would simply say we were inspired by the suffragettes who are now hailed as heroes. There's statues of the suffragettes all around Parliament. What we said time and time again in the court to the jury is that we didn't want to be doing this. We don't want to be there. It's actually a really traumatic experience to go through a three-week crime court trial terrible for my mental health. I can't speak for the other women, but it was grueling. We don't want to be doing it. But what we know is that polite conversation hasn't worked. We know that we're running out of time. What I spoke about to the jury was my own awakening to the climate crisis was the 2018 IPCC report saying we have 12 years left to save humanity. And that was five years ago. I don't downplay that it would have been shocking. Like I'm sure it is. That's part of it. It would have been shocking for people in 1912 or whenever, seeing women break windows all along Regent Street, which is what the suffragettes did. And that shock is part of delivering the message and part of cutting through. And unfortunately, that's where we're at and that's what we have to do. Do you not fear that such tactics might alienate some people from your cause and your central message? I mean, I fear about everything. Yeah, I question everything that I'm doing. I question everything that I'm not doing. I'm sure that it will alienate some people, but I find that a hard question to answer because the crisis that we're facing is so enormous, entirely all-encompassing, the biggest threat to have ever faced humanity, that to worry about the tactics of property damage alienating some people from the message. It's not a message. That's the problem with this. It is reality. This is what is happening. And we need to use all tactics, basically. This happened two years ago that we did this. We've been waiting two years for a trial. And now I'm trying something else. So I believe we all need to try whatever we can. And I encourage anybody listening to this to step outside of your comfort zone. You don't have to go and break windows. (laughs) I hope I'll never do that again. But to step outside of your comfort zone and do whatever you think is appropriate, use whatever tactics you feel are going to be effective to make change. Gali Bujak there. Akshat, I wonder what you made of these nine women being acquitted. I think the jury system is a very interesting system. It's where people decide how the law should be meted out, uh, how the punishment should be meted out. It's also worth noting in these two years, laws around the world to try and get peaceful protesters, not protesting, have only got stronger. This is true here in the UK, it's true in Australia, it's true across the US. And so even as climate change is getting worse, um, their ability to make that message heard is getting harder. Thank you for your thoughts there. More from my guests uh, shortly on the other side of the news. Do stay with us here on Weekend.